Good morning and welcome to Region 2 of HFMA's annual conference. Uh, my name is Bob Hussar and it's great to be with you today, even under these uh, difficult and, and trying times. But we're going to try and forget about that, at least for part of this presentation, and uh, talk about some very important compliance and, and legal updates. For those of you who I have not had the pleasure of meeting in the past, as I said, my name is Bob Hussar. I'm an attorney. I've been practicing in the healthcare field for about 25 years now. I've served as a compliance officer, as a government regulator with the Office of the Medicaid Inspector General, uh, as a consultant with a large accounting firm, and I'm now in private practice where I've been for about the past 10 years, working with providers like yourself on a, on a daily basis. And so I can appreciate the, the trials that you've had over the last several months and, and candidly even and beyond. And uh, I'm, I'm happy to work with you on a day-to-day -day basis in, in overcoming these difficult times. So without further ado, we'll uh, jump into the presentation. Uh, any lawyer is not worth his salt if he doesn't give the disclaimer up front that this is not legal advice. Uh, unfortunately, you'd for you that you'd have to pay me for that. Um, so if you want to send me a $1 retainer, that may change everything. But until that time, this is general guidance. Uh, if you want to talk about a more specific instance or, or fact pattern, I'm certainly happy to do that um, and would welcome that opportunity. What are we going to talk about today? Well, we're going to reflect back over what's transpired over the past six months and really what we were dealing with before COVID-19 hit. We're gonna talk about things specific to New York, but also on a federal level as well, both in terms of budgetary issues, as well as recent updates and what we might expect in the months ahead. When we get into the heart of the presentation, I just wanted to pause for a moment and reflect upon what we've experienced over the past six months and really beyond. I wanna start by saying thank you uh, to all those who you who are on the front lines of healthcare and supporting those on the front lines of healthcare, you've obviously been called to perform a different task as of late, maybe in a more of a supportive role, et cetera. Uh, but all of your efforts are are genuinely and greatly appreciated. So we'll just take this cleansing moment. I'm not someone who's really into to yoga or meditation or whatnot, but I think all of us uh, during the past six months can really need to take a step back and, and decompress for a moment. So uh, I sent you one of my favorite pictures and, and hopefully that will, will help you do that. Okay, well now that that's over, let's get back to work. Uh, and we're gonna talk about stuff that's probably familiar to you, but I've included several slides that are, uh, if nothing else, a good refresher to you, but also something that you can turn to as a refresher and as reference material. We'll start with the numerous waivers that have been in, put in place by both the state and federal government. Uh, starting first with the 1135 waivers, this gives the Department of Health and Human Services the authority to put in place different measures to protect the public health. Uh, you see that the time frame is 60 days or those can be uh, expanded by the secretary. And the vast majority of the waivers we're gonna talk about are still in existence today. So in addition to very specific waiver requests from states, they also have blanket waivers that have been administered by the federal government. And you'll see 40 pages here of blanket waivers were in place as of May 15th, 2020. They were retroactive. And as I said, the, the vast majority of, the, of those are still in existence uh, New York also took kind of a belt and suspenders approach. In addition to the blanket waivers, they submitted their own set of, of waiver requests, and the vast majority of those were also granted back in March. Some of the most pertinent, pertinent waivers for you include EMTALA, uh, which we know is, is something that uh, the government pays very close attention to and is very active in its oversight and auditing. Uh, under these waivers, screenings can occur in locations outside of the emergency room. They can be done via telehealth. Um, but again, keep in mind that like all these waivers, there are limitations on them as well. And with EMTALA, uh, 
it can only occur if it's necessary in order to um, comply and, and safeguard other individuals as a result of COVID um, items and, and issues. HHS has also waived EMTALA sanctions where a patient is directed to go to another location. Typically, we know under EMTALA, you cannot defer a patient to another location unless your um, hospital is on a, on a status to do that. Um, and you can also, in some cases, transfer even when that stabilizing care has not been provided if you're not able to meet the needs and another hospital is better situated to do so. Again, the limitation is it must be necessary due to COVID-19 pandemic. HIP is another area, and we're going to talk a little bit later about the ongoing enforcement efforts related to HIPAA, but HIPAA has been waived uh, in certain circumstances under COVID, and you can see here what those are. Uh, you, oftentimes, we're, we're in a different situation, right, where family has not been able to be present, uh, and individuals may not be able to give their consent to allow providers to talk to family members. So CMS and HHS recognize this and allowed for uh, more ongoing uh, communications without obtaining the prerequisite consents from patients. I'd also uh, provide a relief in other areas such as uh, distributing notices, requiring people to be listed in um, the, the hospital, um, contact information, et cetera. On the HIPAA side though, the waivers are that in order to be applicable, a hospital would have had to institute a disaster protocol. And unlike the EMTALA waivers, there's a very limited period that can only last up to 72 hours from the time the disaster protocol was implemented. Of course, you can re-up those, um, but that's the initial time that it was in existence for. The third waiver I'd like to highlight is the Stark waivers. As all hospitals know, and other providers as well, the government has been very active in enforcement of Stark regulations. And there's been a waiver of, of a lot of these during COVID to allow increased flexibility between hospitals and providers to arrange for people coming in and providing the necessary and, and, and highly needed care. Uh, again, certain limitations, they don't, these are not you know, across the board provisions that allow any type of arrangements to occur. It has to be related to COVID-19 situations, and it has to be specifically with a physician or a physician group. You can't have other third parties who are uh, kind of intervening in these relationships, uh, but there has been a recognition that hospitals needed to get providers in as quickly as possible and didn't necessarily have the time to dot the I's and cross the T's for regulatory purposes. And as we're going to see here, and also with uh, when we talk about some of the statutes where funding was provided, a lot of these provisions will talk about what COVID-19 purposes are, right? And, and, and here's a general definition that we've seen, and this is carried through a lot of, of different provisions, but it talks about, you know, it has to be related to the care or, or the screening or the provision of services related to COVID-19 emergencies and, and care that's required. And the final waiver I want to touch upon is telehealth. I think one of the silver linings, if there are any, related to COVID-19 is the increased uh, provision of telehealth services. I think this is something that we will see that uh, outlasts hopefully the COVID-19 pandemic. And this has uh, this expansion has been vast, and it was uh, swiftly implemented. As in the past, there were very strict limitations on when telehealth could be provided and where it could be provided. Most of those requirements were thrown out the window, at least temporarily. And as I said, we'll see what what uh, happens after the fact. But they no longer need to be an established patient. They no longer need to be in a particular location. Um, and, and they no longer need to be only for specific types of, of conditions. Uh, telehealth is now widely accepted and oftentimes at the same rate as in-service or in-person services are reimbursed. 
we're in the we're going to skip ahead of that one for now. Uh, and I, I did forget about the prescribing waiver uh, that I wanted to mention. Again, similar to telehealth, this is an expansion of services that no longer requires a physician to have face-to-face -face interactions prior to uh, prescribing uh, a medical condition. S like telehealth, this expansion of services, this waiver uh, opens providers up to increased potential for fraud and abuse. And the government has been very clear on that. So while this expansion has, is in existence, providers are cautioned that they need to have safeguards in place to make sure that uh, these services are not misused and, and that fraud and abuse is not running rampant. Okay, on the prescribing side, similar to what we're gonna see in telehealth and on, uh, at the state level, in order to have a meaningful interaction, there's an expectation that while people may not be in person, that there is an ongoing communication, that that communication is taking place through secure lines, um, that's two-way interactive, uh, it needs to be in accordance with state and federal laws, and you need to make sure that, the, that this is not something that's being broadcast to the world, right? So, for example, it'd be inappropriate for providers for prescribing purposes or for telehealth services to utilize systems like Facebook or other outward facing technology. Not unlike the federal level, the state has implemented telehealth guidelines. Uh, not really much to highlight here um, other than uh, that this is not only a permissible service, but also it's um, required for managed care companies to actually cover uh, telehealth services. And in fact, uh, as I was driving in today, I heard something on the radio that talked about a health insurer advertising that all of its telehealth services are provided for free now. There's not even a co-payment or deductible um, that is uh, permissible uh, within that health plan for those services. And we're seeing uh, some disingenuous advertising out there as well. Uh, I've seen health plans say, oh, get all of your COVID testing and services for free. Well, that's great for them to say, but it's not that they're providing them for free. It's that the government is, is not charging people and, and will reimburse those plans or providers for those services. Um, so just a precautionary word, it's, it's not always as it appears. Okay, and as I said, uh, some of these, require special billing requirements, special billing provisions, modifiers, et cetera. Still requires consent, although that consent doesn't need to be in writing. So there are hoops as always, and, and thank goodness to some extent for job security for those of us who are in the compliance and regulatory fields, right? We have to meet the underlying requirements uh, and, and that's something that we're still gonna be required. They may change those requirements, but it doesn't mean that we can dispense of them altogether. Okay, also by way of backdrop, you know, prior to COVID hitting, there was ongoing issues from a financial perspective. Those have been made dramatically worse, obviously, by the pandemic, but the, there were issues in discussion even before uh, the pandemic reached the shores of the U.S. We saw this, uh, particularly in New York, with the 2021 budget discussions and the, I guess, reemergence of the uh, Medicaid redesign team, uh, dot two, I guess, or point two, second version of this. There was a lot of talk uh, prior to COVID about the difficult financial, financial situation the state was in. In fact, in New York, there was a $2.5 billion um, shortfall that was established in the Medicaid program that they were trying to close that gap on. And so there was a lot of talk about withholding payments or delaying payments and also other initiatives that were underway to try and close that gap. Some of those directly related to hospitals, including reductions in the hospital supplemental pool payments, um, as well as changing, um, you know, different services that were allowed and, and the way that those were delivered. Uh, we talk about reducing the drug cap growth by enhancing the purchasing power to lower um, the cost of drugs and also establish a plan of care incentive and penalty payments for care management. And as I said earlier, there was an across the board 
rate reduction and also a delay in payments. Part of the budget discussions uh, talked a lot about overpayments and this is something that's gonna, we're gonna carry through our theme of, of this discussion is that with these budget shortfalls, there is going to be a heightened sense of, of auditing and enforcement actions uh, to help close that, that gap. We saw this in New York um, back when I was with the OMIG, uh, when, when we had different requirements, collection requirements placed on us as part of the F Sharp program. You know, that term probably sends shivers down uh, some indiv individual spines, um, but we were required to collect $1.5 billion during that period. Don't be surprised if you're gonna see additional bounties, if you will, out there um, by state and the federal government to try and make up a lot of these budget gaps. Okay. We've all heard about the federal requirements to return an overpayment within 60 days. CMS had regulations out there. Part of the budget discussions and what passed in the budget was a formal self-disclosure process through the OMIG. A lot of it mirrors what we've seen at the federal level in terms of the 60 day repayment requirement. Um, but they also formalized the self-disclosure program that was originally created in Section 363D of the Social Services Law. They've also, the state has authorized increased penalties for a variety of infractions, including failure to have a compliance program. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Um, but also failure to provide access to records uh, and failure to timely disclose overpayments. So, these are additional tools and penalties. The tools are, are out there to assist not only OMIG, but the, the Mafuku, uh, for those of you who don't know, the Medicaid Fraud Control Unit, uh, commonly and, and endearingly referred to as the Mafuku, and also the Department of Health, New York State DOH, uh, to get timely access to, to information. And that can include audit information, reviews, but also uh, cost reports and uh, the requirement to submit and counter data, all of that is, is wrapped up into here. Other fraud and abuse uh, provisions include penalties, as I say, for not uh, for either misstating cost reports or not submitting them timely. They require managed care companies to have special investigative units. And now they've had that in the past, but they've lowered the threshold. Now you only need to have a thousand enrollees for a managed care plan to have a special investigations unit. And you know that that is gonna be directly um, uh, impactful to you when these SIUs that have uh, biannual reporting requirements on what their activities are to talk about how they're conducting audits of their providers like yourself. Next, I wanna to turn to compliance programs, um, both at the state and federal level. OMIG uh, has had a requirement that certain providers, including all hospitals, have mandatory compliance programs for the past uh, 14, 15 years now. Um, so that hasn't changed, but the budget did enact new requirements that will allow, give OMIG greater um, authority and, and um, enforcement power to go after providers who do not have effective compliance programs in place. So uh, it's always required hospitals to have an effective program, but there really wasn't a lot of teeth behind what could happen if you didn't have one. And the new legislation now authorized um, entities uh, or Mafuku and, and OMIG to impose fines and penalties for a failure to have an effective program in place. And those penalties uh, grow over time. Um, they're imposed monthly, um, but after a certain amount of time, they can jump up to significant amounts of money. So it's important uh, to, to revisit those requirements. There are changes in the expectations of those compliance programs. Examples include um, requiring a compliance committee, something again, most hospitals do have and have had in place but was never really a requirement under the OMIG's old legislation and regulations. Um, and these ex uh, 
compliance expectations have been expanded in terms of scope of, of what providers are now covered. Uh, and that could be helpful to you actually when you're partnering with different providers, particularly through smaller providers through value-based arrangements and other types of um, joint ventures, you, you might have greater comfort in the fact that some of these smaller providers uh, are now required to have programs in place. Um, but, you know, as I said, that's a double-edged sword because the OMIG has announced that they're going to be coming very active with compliance reviews again, uh, starting January 1st of, of next year. And I would say two very significant developments is that adopting and implementing an effective compliance program is now a condition of payment. I can't tell you how many conversations I had when I was at the OMIG uh, where providers would try and make an argument that this is a condition of participation as opposed to a condition of payment. Uh, we actually went through the exercise at some point of, of kind of defining in uh, audit protocols which were conditions of payment versus conditions of our participation. And they said, you can't take money back uh, for a claim if it was only a condition of participation. It's clear now that if you don't have an effective program in place, they can go after claim submissions and deny those claims solely on the basis that you do not have an effective compliance program in place. Second, in addition to imposing fines and penalties, the OMIG is now authorized to revoke a provider's participating agreement within Medicaid if they fail to have an effective program in place. Okay. So it's time to dust off those programs. Um, you know, I, I realize compliance may not have been a priority over the past six months uh, or longer, but, but certainly this is gonna be renewed uh, scrutiny and attention from I think all levels of government. On the federal level, uh, as you're likely aware, the Department of Justice came out with their new standards or, or new guidance, at least documents, on what's expected of compliance programs. And they, unlike the past, really didn't mix the message here, that there is a clear expectation that these programs are going to be in place and that they need to be effective. Um, and you see some, some comments here that it is a, um, an expectation because the value of compliance is to um, reduce overpayments, reduce fraud and abuse, and, and make the program more fiscally sound. Some of the questions that the DOJ is requiring prosecutors to ask is, is the program well designed? Is it being applied earnestly and in good faith? And finally, does the program work in practice? Now, it's interesting to me that they specifically said a positive answer to all of those questions is not required. Um, to me, that is the hallmark of an effective program when it's operating on all cylinders. But they they left some room there to say if you're not if you don't have all these answers and or, or with a positive response, you're not necessarily going to you know fall short of the requirements if and this is the last bullet there you're able to explain the negative answers and 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 justify why you may not meet one of those three areas so let's turn a little bit more detail into what the department of justice is talking about is the program well designed and here again these should there should be no surprises on what they're looking at are there risk assessments? Are there policies and procedures, training communications, right? Most of these are discussed uh, and have been discussed for years as part of the OIG guidance documents, as part of what we see through HHCCA and other um, associations and, and how people are supposed to design effective compliance programs. There's occasional things move in and out, right? Mergers and acquisitions is something relatively new where there hasn't been a lot of focus by the government on that in the past. Um, but again, making sure that these, this is a, a well-designed document that really is uh, implemented and really touches on all aspects of the organization. Question number two, 
is, is the program being applied earnestly and in good faith? And here the prosecutors are, are asked to look at, is there a commitment by senior and middle management, right? And this is a document, if you haven't done so already, this is something that I would share with your senior and middle management and the board of directors, right? Because this is talking to them directly and saying, this, it's not just the compliance officer's obligation. It's not just, you know, people on the front lines. This is a commitment that's made by everyone in the organization. And has the organization put its money where its mouth is and provided the autonomy and resources necessary uh, to make this work? And on the other side of that, are there incentives and disciplinary measures um, to make sure this works? Question number three. Does the corporation's compliance program work in practice? Again, we have to dust off those books, right? We know as compliance officers, the worst thing you can do is have a very nice compliance program in a binder that's sitting on a shelf that is not being reviewed and updated periodically and evolving, right? I believe in the theory of relativity as it relates to compliance programs, and that is the government, whether it's state or, or federal prosecutors and, and enforcement agencies are going in providers like yourself on a regular basis. And they're seeing what other providers are doing. You do not want to be uh, viewed as an underachiever as it relates to compliance relative to you know, a, a competitor of yours. So you need to make sure that there's you know, continuous improvement, that you're periodically testing that this is an effective program, whether it be through surveys or, or testing after educational programs, et cetera, and that you know, you're improving, uh, that their problems, while they may not be going down necessarily, they're at least not being repetitive issues, that corrective action processes are being put into place, um, and, and hopefully that there are less, less incidents, but at least if there aren't, that those are being caught and addressed uh, fully in a timely manner. And of course, we do compliance because it's the right thing to do, but also because ultimately we hope that it will save us time and, and, and money and pain in, in, in the future. Uh, and while we may have had a brief reprieve from some of the audit and enforcement activity out there, certainly we know that, that that's not gone. And so I want providing you with a, a sample of recent initiatives and memos uh, indicating the government is still active and will continue to ramp up and, and be even more active going forward. The first of this is a CMS memo you see in front of you from August of this year talking about you know coming off of pause as it relates to some of the enforcement activities that were underway when COVID hit and really talking about how they're going to re release additional guidance on reprioritizing those initiatives. Uh, so looking back and saying okay we're not going to pick up every enforcement action um, from day one. Certainly we're going to start with those where uh, there's the greatest risk to, to patients uh, as it relates to, to potential jeopardy or harm, um, but then also going back and more systematically going through um, all of their enforcement actions um, and, and, and really picking those balls up and, and, and making sure that nothing is left behind. The other um, one of the highlights I want to mention from the OIG is you'll see here that there was uh, very recently a, a national takedown that was announced uh, of a size and, and scope that I haven't seen in, in quite some time. This focused on opioids and, and, and other types of um, schemes where they went after 345 providers, including 100, over 100 physicians. Uh, and they looked at people who were in very involved schemes, looking at issues like um, you know, pharmacies and, and telehealth and other areas that were colluding to order unnecessary services or goods. Um, there were kickbacks involved in these schemes, a very, very extensive um, takedown. Um, and again, 
but by the numbers that we haven't seen in years, millions of dollars um, that were recovered. And as I said, hundreds and, and hundreds of, of individuals that were you know, prosecuted and, and also a number that were excluded from the program as a result of that. Here's a second slide on that. Really, the, the scheme was essentially that telemedicine executives were making arrangements with both practitioners and providers, including pharmacies and, and labs and DME companies to um, write bogus scripts um, to fill those scripts and bill Medicaid for those items um, and services, and then provide a kickback to the executives who were uh, arranging those schemes and, and devise those schemes. At the state level, uh, just within the last couple of weeks, we saw the comptroller's office come out with a sizable audit, um, five audits actually. And you can see it identified over $706 million in unnecessary, improper, or questionable payments. And those spanned across a multitude of providers and suppliers. Um, this is uh, the way these always work is the comptroller office comes out and gives a black eye to the Department of Health for paying for these um, services, claims and services uh, that were inappropriate. And then they always require the DOH or OME to go back and collect any of the, uh, the inappropriately paid funds. So OMIG is operational, the controller is operational, the Mafuku is operational. As I say, that, that, that permanent, or I'm sorry, the temporary pause has really been, been lifted. Okay, I want to hit on a couple of hot topic areas. Uh, again, these may, the first one is pretty mainstream, but some of the others are, are not necessarily things that are popping up in your, your everyday life, but if they're not, I, I expect they will be. First uh, is HIPAA. Uh, if you look at this, this is a truncated list of, of several enforcement actions that have, have occurred since the spring, and, and there are more. Um, but the top one is a recovery by OCR against Prima, uh, pr pr I'm sorry, Primera Blue Cross. This was the second largest uh, HIPAA enforcement action that has occurred to date, second only to a, the Anthem settlement that we saw back in 2018 for $16 million. This was a $6.85 million settlement uh, for a data breach. And the issues were that the provider failed to conduct enterprise-wide risk assessment um, as was required by statute and regulation and also a failure to implement risk management and audit protocols. So, while we've seen some waivers, as we discussed earlier, as it relates to HIPAA, it certainly is not a, a across the board waiver and enforcement is still very active. The second item I wanna highlight on this list is the fourth item down. Uh, back in 2019, there was an announcement of a HIPAA right to access initiative and OCR recently, just in the last couple of weeks, uh, announced a five settlements related to that. And you can see on this list here that OCR is going after smaller providers and larger providers. Uh, the settlement amounts seem to take into account the size and complexity of those organizations. Yet, I can tell you the first one on the list, Housing Works Inc. is a New York provider, relatively small, and they had a, a situation where they failed to disclose a record to a patient that had requested it. And then even after a complaint was made to OCR and OCR contacted the provider, they did a follow-up a couple months later and they still hadn't provided it. Um, so again, this is a, a clear message to the healthcare providers about the importance and necessity of compliance with HIPAA rules and particularly sharing information with patients and when authorized their family members um, as they have a right to inspect and, and review their health records. The next area I want to talk about is quasi-compliance. I'm sure many of you are getting involved with managed care denials. Uh, this is something that I'm being called upon increasingly to assist providers with because of the, the time associated with responding 
uh, and, and trying to uh, appeal these denials, um, but also the, the magnitude of the dollars involved. And so um, my humor for the day is, is the denial ain't just a river in Egypt, according to Mark Twain. Um, but I also worked with someone in revenue cycle back when I was a compliance officer who used to say, you can't have a good fight uh, without a denial. Um, and we can certainly have some good fights over those. But denials are very important to you, right? In addition to um, the lack of money there's, there's, that you're receiving, uh, it's very time sensitive. And those denials can be based on any number of factors, right? And we, we see these run the gamut. And I'm sure you see these every week, if not every day, uh, in your current roles. But they can be denied based on eligibility purposes, prior auths, medical necessity, supporting documentation, and non-covered services. Beyond the money uh, that you lose from a denial, all denials have costs. Because even if you win them on appeal, you're getting the same dollars that you were entitled to, yet there's a lot of costs associated with employee work involved. Um, there's a cost, obviously, if you lose or don't pursue those, right? And sometimes you may decide it's, it's not worth the process, not worth the fight, I'm sorry, not worth the time and money to fight given the process that you have to go through. Um, sometimes we don't even have a good handle on what those denials are meaning to us, right? We may not be having uh, someone who's tracking them regularly and staying on top of those. And of course, if we do fight them, not only is it our own time, but also the time for experts uh, to, to go out and, and make your case on your behalf. So we can't, um, we can't turn a blind eye to that as more and more services are being reimbursed by, by Medicaid and Medicare managed care. Uh, th these denials are an increasing risk to us. So Something you can do as compliance officers is to work with your, your folks, your revenue cycle folks and, and financial folks to really try and turn these denials around. And a lot of it is gonna be driven by your contract. So you really have to know the provisions of those uh, the contract terms, particularly statutory, I'm sorry, uh, definition sections. You know, what is the eligibility uh, criteria? What is the definition of medical necessity? what is the requirements around prior authorizations. You've got to be able to manage that contract. This is not something uh, that you have to take and, and you're required to take, the, or take it or leave it in a lot of cases. I, I know a lot of providers on the call today have great leverage and you need to assess and then exercise that leverage um, in order to overcome some of these issues. How do you manage your contract? Well, you need to know you know, how, what the process is. There's gonna be a different process depending on the type of disputed claim or denial, right? And you gotta figure out and, and track the time periods, the process, the rights, and, and then ultimately how you recover those funds if you're successful in, in doing so. To me, the termination clause in your contract is one of the most important. And I understand that most providers say, oh, there's no way we could ever, ever terminate a contract you would be surprised. You would be surprised uh, because sometimes that's the number one, the only thing that works and, and gets a managed care plan's attention. But some of you are going to be in locations where if you were to terminate your agreement, they're not going to have an adequate network and they're not going to be able to market um, that they do have coverage across the state or in a particular area where they're not going to have adequate resources to care for their members. And so the termination clause, the timing and the conditions of the, that uh, ability to terminate are extremely important. And even when you start flexing your muscles, I've seen managed care plans do a 180 in terms of their aggressiveness uh, and the scope and frequency of their audits um, if you threaten to, to terminate if they don't change their practice. Again, what does the contract say in terms of their right to audit? How often can they do it? What is the magnitude? the frequency, okay? All of these should be outlined in your contract and those are something that when a contract renewal is up, it should be number one or two on your list next to rates. And then what are your appeal rights? And oftentimes con contracts will include both internal and external rights. And sometimes, you know, you're gonna have a managed care company that says, we have our experts that say this, 
And you're going to say, well, we have our providers that say the opposite. And you're going to need to go to maybe a third party and agree to both of you to pay to, to bring in a third party, a neutral third party, who could be the decider, um, the, the, the tiebreaker, if you will. And then maybe you, you decide on what is an overpayment based upon that third party. But leverage is going to be key in all of this. Um, certainly, uh, your folks, um, both on the front line as well as in, in finance and in other words, uh, other departments are going to have relationships with your managed care plans, and you should leverage those relationships. You should look at your denial history. Um, you should exercise your, your leverage with peers um, and associations to apply pressure, including at the bottom here, you can utilize um, the state entities, DOH and DFS, and the provisions they have to make sure that you're getting paid appropriately. And if you feel that there are unfair business practices, you can bring that to their attention. So look at you know, who your experts are, bring in people. Sometimes you can save a lot of money. And that's gonna be more important, as I say, as these other audits and investigations ramp up um, because the government's trying to close those, those uh, shortfalls. The other provision that's not gonna be applicable to all of you, but I wanted to raise because more and more hospitals are the subject of New York State Justice Center investigations. This is uh, in the world of enforcement, a relatively new oversight agency. It's been in existence for about seven years now. And their job really is to protect individuals with um, disabilities and, and, and those who are vulnerable. So it oversees programs such as um, OASIS providers, those who are dealing with substance use disorders, as well as uh, OMH and OPWDD. So if you have a substance use uh, disorder clinic that you run or an outpatient mental health or an inpatient behavioral health unit, the Justice Center has oversight over those units. And all it takes is one phone call from a disgruntled patient or family member to have a Justice Center investigation. Um, and they are very aggressive. They have very broad uh, authority. They conduct about 7,500 uh, investigations uh, a year. And if you haven't seen them, uh, thank your lucky stars because it is not a fun process to go through. You should make sure that your employees in those areas that I mentioned, whether it be um, OASIS providers or OMH mental health providers know that they are mandated reporters. And this is different than the statutory requirements for other mandated reporters. It's specific to Justice Center incidents, um, but it does apply to consultants, employees, volunteers, contractors who have regular and substantial contact with service recipients. And those service recipients are the individuals who are receiving services from, you know, mental health services, substance uh, use disorder services, et cetera. So, and then there's also other statutory requirements uh, for nurses and, and physicians and social workers, et cetera, uh, who are also mandated reporters. What are we looking at here? We're looking at instances of abuse or neglect. And abuse uh, is easier in my mind to, to define, although it's not just physical abuse. You can see here psychological or emotional abuse. Uh, aversive conditioning, et cetera. And then neglect is a very broad category that almost anyone can fit into. Uh, and so they have, as I say, a, a, a very uh, wide set of, of um, uh, authority and, and enforcement ability to go after providers in these areas. So make sure that your employees are aware of this. Uh, if someone has a substantiated report against them, which is not too ha hard to have. It's simply a preponderance of the evidence standard. It's not beyond a reasonable doubt like we see in the criminal uh, area. Although I should mention the Justice Center does have criminal authority as well. But if someone has a, a category one finding against them by the Justice Center, they are excluded for life from practicing in that industry, okay? For life, unlike Medicaid and Medicare exclusions, there is no mechanism to apply to get back into the program. There is no set duration on the, that exclusion period. It is permanent with no ability to try and get back in. 
Okay, finally, let's turn, you know, I, hopefully this gave you somewhat of a break from, from COVID, but, um, but, but needless to say, this is, this is going to be with us. We hear about the hot spots or the red zones uh, where, where we're seeing increased activity, even in New York State. Uh, and so, and I know we have Puerto Rico folks with us as well. Um, none of us are, are immune or, or can escape this. So let's talk about how your world intersects with compliance and how it will going forward. Right? So there are a number of funding sources that have been out there. Um, they range anywhere from the initial funding stream signed by President Trump back in as early as March, I think March 6th of the, this year. Uh, that was an initial influx of money to help fight um, this, this pandemic, mostly money going towards um, healthcare providers to cover their increased costs. We then saw the Families First Coronavirus um, Response Act that allowed for individuals time off, a paid time off if they were, uh, had contracted the virus or were quarantined and also then subsequently for people who had to leave their jobs to provide childcare when schools were shut down, et cetera. Uh, then we had the Corona, the CARES Act, right? And the CARES Act threw billions and billions of dollars into the economy and, and towards healthcare providers uh, to, again, uh, number one, to help stimulate the economy, but also uh, to help providers with increased costs and expenses. And as part of that, we saw the Paycheck Protection Program and, and Healthcare Enforcement Act. Um, all of these are were, were things trying to help the economy and, and help small businesses and providers to, to deal with this situation but they all come with compliance risks and compliance obligations, right? We know the PPP was put into place uh, to, to help keep people at work and, and help uh, pay their employees and also pay their rents and whatnot. This has been a program that has been evolving over time, um, that the regulations have changed on multi and guidance has changed on multiple occasions uh, and the eligibility um, has been a question um, and, and particularly the loan forgiveness portion has been an evolving standard and it's very difficult, but um, for the smaller providers out there, something that you probably relied on heavily, um, but, but now need to make sure that you dot your I's and cross your T's. Certainly the, there's SBA guidance out on the PPP. Uh, this money was put in place uh, to as I say, help stem the tides of, of, of rents and, and employment costs that couldn't be covered. Uh, we need to make sure that when we're looking to have these loans forgiven, that all the reports that we provide, all the attestations um, are true and accurate and can be supported by ongoing documentation requirements. Next, we have had a lot of funding through the Public Health and Social Services Emergency Fund, right? And this is where most of you are probably familiar. Over $100 billion was invested in the CARES Act for healthcare providers. There have been both general releases as well as um, more targeted funding. And depending on uh, what type of provider you are and what your specific corona situation was, you were able to cover more or less um, some of those operating expenses. But again, this is, um, this is fraught with peril and it's gonna require your attention and your, your agency's attention going forward, right? Because when you accepted those payments, uh, and maybe some of you haven't even accepted some of those payments because we've had uh, a series of general distributions and then targeted distributions, all of them you have to either uh, deny that grant within 90 days of its uh, award, or you are going to be held to the terms and conditions um, that, that apply to that. And what are those? They include, you know, making regular reports, having documentation available, um, attestations that this is money that is um, covering costs that have not been covered by, by other um, forms of, of government um, subsidies or, or grants or loans. So we're going to see an increased focus on these areas. We, we've heard several agencies already 
actively out there reviewing this documentation or indicating that they will be. And you don't have to take my word for it. Here's uh, Attorney General William Barr indicating that this is going to be a priority of every U.S. Attorney's Office um, and that they're going to make sure that providers are not charging inappropriate amounts to individuals. People are only getting reimbursed for appropriate tests that have been approved, et cetera. Here's another example. This just came out in the last few days where uh, an agency is going to be auditing. This is part of the OIG work plan, the updated work plan. And this is indicating that the funds that are used for um, disadvantaged individuals who can't cover uninsured individuals, um, funds that were used to reimburse providers for those services are going to be audited. We've heard about the Pandemic Response Accountability Committee, right, that was created in response to the CARES Act. Going to be looking at these issues and going to be conducting random audits. And we've seen a whole host of others, right, some of which are familiar to us, the FBI and, and IGs. We have a special IG for the pandemic recovery. We have congressional oversight committees uh, and so on and so forth. So these enforcement activities are going to be um, a regular part of our life, uh, perhaps take over our life in certain ways. Um, although given what I talked about earlier with compliance requirements, we're going to have to going to have to have a, a, a split attention both to these new compliance issues, uh, which hopefully, and I, I, I say this with, with true hope that you get some additional resources uh, to oversee, um, but then also, you know, the old, the, the ongoing regular compliance requirements. So some final thoughts here, uh, you know, you don't need me to tell you that we're in unprecedented and, and, and quite uncertain times as we see what likely will be a, another spike in, in COVID inflictions and, and deaths, um, there's no question, absolutely no question in my mind that you're going to have more audit activity than you've ever seen before, both in terms of the traditional audit and recovery activities by state agencies like the OMIG and the MFUKU, um, but also on the managed care side. Uh, we're trying to close their budget gaps. We're going to see additional uh, incentive uh, initiatives from, from state and, and federal governments. And your job uh, is not an easy one. Uh, no one, uh, I, think, uh, I think everyone would agree with that, but it, it's going to become increasingly difficult. You're going to be pulled in, in different directions and more directions, and compliance has to stay nimble and flexible and pivot to meet the changing um, and yet ongoing needs uh, that the organizations have. And I, I wish you the best of luck in, in those endeavors. Uh, you know, if I can ever be assistance, if you have questions uh, related to anything here or beyond, happy to, to have a call with you. And, um, you know, I thank you for your time. And with that, I think I'd like to, um, we're going to go live now with the, the presentation and answer uh, any questions that you have, any thoughts that you want to share. Again, I always believe that. Um, Hopefully this has been meaningful to you, but we certainly have a number of other individuals who are fighting the same fight that you are on a daily basis. And it's always helpful to, to hear from them and to share their thoughts and experiences and, and suggestions as well.